The U.S. Constitution is the framework for the federal government of the United States. It's the highest form of law in the country, and it basically helps us know what we, we can and can't do in our country as things change. The Bill of Rights was made so that people know their individual rights, other than states' rights, which um, in the U.S. Constitution have a lot of power. The First Amendment is in the Bill of Rights, and it's all about keeping the government from trying to dictate what you can believe or express, what you can say, and what you can do. One note, though, public schools are not part. Uh, public schools are part of the government. When the Constitution says the government it has to do something, that includes public schools have to do what the government is doing. This is very different than private schools because private schools are in private poverty. Students almost always have more legal protections in public schools and federal laws can apply in private schools, but because of extreme protection of private property and all that fun stuff, um, federal laws don't always apply on private school property and state and local laws sometimes, but can rarely help private school students. Um, the First Amendment protects freedom of speech, religion, press, assembly, and petition. And we're going to break those down in the next few slides. First, we have freedom of speech. The government can't stop you from expressing your opinions and beliefs, whether that's through music, your speech, or symbolic ways like art or music or dancing. If the government provides a form, it has to allow all viewpoints. And expressing your opinion is not protected in privately owned spaces. Therefore, private schools, it's not very much always protected. When it says you have to provide a forum, if you want to draw a picture about a vino cream and your partner wants to draw a picture about Vaseline, the government and your school have to both show both of those pictures, even if the principal hates a vino cream. Stupid example, but it's true. Uh, and freedom of religion. You can believe what you want, practice it however you want, and the government can't promote, ban, or regulate religion at school. If you want to wear a hijab, you're allowed to. At school, religious clubs can also um, exist, but they have to have the same access as other clubs and can't be stopped or given too much power. Awesome. So the um, another protection that you have based on the Constitution and the Bill of Rights is freedom of the press. Um, that means um, within the school, uh, you have the right to uh, do independent uh, distribution of um, things like zines or handouts. But if it is school sponsored, that or from resources that the school provides, you are more limited in what you can say, um, especially if it's something both school sanctioned, because the school is um, a body that, because of in loco parentis, can control. Um, to some extent, what you say based on those resources. Um, moreover, uh, you also have freedom of assembly. From a school perspective, that means you can um, have clubs and your clubs can't be treated differently based on the club's viewpoint. So if a school has the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, that needs to be treated the same as the Gender and Sexuality Alliance in terms of access to meeting space, funds, posters that are up on the walls, um, all of that. Um, additionally, outside of school, you can do um, whatever uh, you would like, and you have that right to freedom of assembly and uh, peacefully protest um, at any events outside of school, regardless of the political affiliation of those events. So if you want to go to the Women's March or anything similar, that is very much within your rights to do so. Um, you can also protest within schools, but you can't be um, disruptive. And we'll go into a couple of the other places where the school can restrict that um, uh, within school time. Um, additionally, you have the freedom of petition. That means even as a student, you, know, you have the right to sue the government for violating your rights. Um, and you can also, as I mentioned earlier, advocate for um, your rights outside of school, um, meaning going to protests, lobbying for laws um, and policies you believe in outside of school. So when can you be prevented from doing this? So we talked on interrupting class time, but you can also have it be um, your speech be restricted uh, when it's looted for fame. Um, 
we'll get into a couple of examples of that when it's school sponsored speech. So like we talked about with the newspapers and freedom of the press, if it's something that the school um, has paid for or if it promotes illegal drug use. All right, so let's talk about one of the most important cases. Uh, and it was the first case that actually gave students um, rights in school about their freedom of expression. And this is the 1969 Tinker v. Des Moines case. And we're really lucky to have Miss um, Tinker here today with us. She went to the Supreme Court as a teenager, a very young child, and won us all the right to have freedom of expression in our school. Um, so in this case, she and her brother, um, who was a little bit older than her, but also a teen, uh, wore these black armbands to school in support uh, and protesting the war in Vietnam, like other students had done. But when they went to school, um, they got suspended for it, and they felt that their rights had been denied. And so they went to the Supreme Court, and they were the first people to make their way up to the Supreme Court through um, the multiple courts. and. Uh, have a decision made on our freedom of expression. And the Supreme Court said, students don't shed their constitutional rights to freedom or spe of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate, which meant that kids were allowed to speak the way that it wa they wanted, say what they wanted, express themselves in the ways that they wanted, as long as it didn't cause a material or substantial disruption, which is very key, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So the question is, what is really disruptive? And this happens a lot when students go to school um, wearing different things or expressing themselves in different ways and other people react to it. And then there's a conversation about what does disruption mean? So we ask ourselves questions. Did it interfere with classwork or other school activities? Were other students so upset by it that they couldn't learn? And who did the speech really come from? So if you go to school and you're wearing a t-shirt in support of Cory Booker, who's not running for president anymore, and um, a student who supports Elizabeth Warren starts screaming at you, you're not the one who's really being disruptive, it's the other student. Uh, and so you're not causing the material and substantial disruption, so you're still allowed to express yourself in that way, and that's totally fine. This is an example. So if Janet wears a t-shirt supporting Stacey Abrams, a political politician running for government to school, and then Peter and his friends refuse to do any work and scream at Janet and the teacher about how rude her shirt is. Um, this is a question, who made the disruption? In this case, it was actually um, Peter, because he was the one that was screaming, and um, who is exercising the right to freedom of speech, both of them, because they are um, using their freedom of speech rightfully. However, who protect who is protected under the first amendment janet because peter created a material and substantial disruption who should be punished if at all uh i would say in this case it's peter because peter was the one that created the disruption so let's think about another example of places where a student speech has been um Restricted. In this case, uh, we're talking about lewdness. Um, in the case Bethel School District versus Frazier, um, uh, one young man, when uh, making a speech about his can his friend who was running for student government, um, gave some of the following language in the speech. Um, so you can read that for yourself there, but um, it contains a lot of innuendos, if you will. Um, I'm not going to read it out loud. Um, and as a result of this, he was suspended for two days from his school um, and felt that his First Amendment rights had been violated because he hadn't really said um, anything uh, basically bad or inappropriate um, or that he thought fell under any of those categories because he didn't really say anything um, that like literally would be lewd. But the Supreme Court disagreed um, and the case went all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, so uh, the Supreme Court said that part of a public school's job was uh, that they could, in fact, prohibit the use of vulgar and lewd terms um, or vulgar and offensive terms in public discourse. Uh, so they upheld his suspension and basically said the school can restrict lewd speech. So let's talk about the types of the expression that are protected. 
being out, um, talking about LGBTQ plus issues, expressing your gender identity with your clothes, class projects, papers, and book reports are all protected. You can also wear t-shirts, armbands, wristbands, and buttons to show your support uh, for different ideas. Uh, bulletin boards, banners, and flags are supported. And even if you don't want to speak, you're allowed to do that, like not reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, Tinker is still used today as a very important um, decision in protecting student speech. And this, an example of this was in 2008, where Miss Gilman, this child over here, um, was going to school and she wanted to show support, she and her friends, actually, for a cousin of hers who was in the LGBTQ plus community and they wanted to do so by wearing rainbows. Um, so an example would be a pink Floyd t-shirt with a rainbow on it or a rainbow belt or having the Apple logo with a rainbow on it. And the principal was outraged by this and um, continuously tried to stop her and her friends from doing this. Um, and they kept on trying to fight it in court and it went up to the Florida Supreme Court, but the school kept on moving. Why? Because the students weren't actually creating a material disruption. They were just wearing rainbows to school and sometimes other kids would talk about it and sometimes they wouldn't. And the children themselves were not prohibiting or stopping other things in the school from happening. It was that other people were talking about it and for some reason that was really getting on the nerves of this clearly bigoted principal. Um, so Tinker is also still used today, as I was explaining, and Alan's going to talk about free expression in school events. Uh, so another place where we've seen the court uphold um, the rights of young people is within who you can take to a school dance, um, and whether same-sex couples or same-gender couples are allowed to go to a dance together, um, and that's been upheld by courts. Uh, now. Um, Legally, these haven't been upheld, but the ACLU has stated that when it comes to free expression within school events, the ACLU believes you can wear gender non-conforming clothes to school events. Um, and the ACLU believes that um, anybody can run for like slightly gender titles like homecoming king or homecoming uh, or like prom queen and so on and so forth. Um, uh, that said, these haven't been upheld in court cases, and this deserved a whole presentation in and of itself as well. Um, around um, what free expression looks like in school. All right, so let's talk about dress codes now because they're pretty, they're a pretty big thing. Across the US, dress codes discriminate against both girls and people of color. Um, rules against showing bra straps, cleavage, et cetera, have historically been put in place to avoid, quote unquote, distracting others, often specified to be male students and staff. And bans on dreadlocks or natural hair are a perpetration of racism in school systems. Now, we are gonna try to cover talking about dress codes, but in no way are we doing it full justice, and it could probably have its own workshop series on it because it's such a deep issue in our school system. An example of this is DeAndre Arnold. Um, DeAndre Arnold had to transfer schools after being suspended for having dreadlocks, and the school system refused to change its rules. This is very, bigoted of them. In addition, um, these two girls uh, who went to um, Boston Public Schools um, were told that they couldn't enter a school dance because um, they were they had hair extensions in. These rules unfairly target people of color, especially black girls, and a national study by the Women's Law Center found that black girls face unique burdens. Um, these include bans on non-religious head rights, uh, bans on hair extensions, and discriminatory enforcement that sees black girls as more promiscuous. Um, not only are these rules discriminatory, but the enforcement of them is as well, especially where the rules are less specific. Um, this ends up just uh, perpetrating a system that is inherently um, racist, and it hurts black girls, indigenous girls, and people of color the most, because in the long run, um, these discriminatory rules um, will get on their record uh, for a long time. This affects universities that they get into and future jobs. So what does this look like in your life and moving forward? So we listed a couple of examples earlier about ways that activism can show up in your life. And um, another place that we can think about is walkouts. Um, 
And schools can, in fact, discipline students for leaving school grounds without permission um, during the school day, even for political speech. But that punishment can only be comparable to a punishment um, for leaving the school for leaving school grounds um, in order to protest um, something, uh, in order to protest something else or even for something non-political, that has to be the same punishment um, across the board. So moving forward, uh, what are ways that you can continue to be involved in exercising your free speech on school grounds um, and continue to be active um, politically uh, within schools and outside of them? With that thank you all for coming um, and this uh, most of this presentation came from Chris Hampton at the um, American Civil Liberties Union um, as part of the National LGBT and HIV project um, if you have any questions for her or about the presentation please feel free to reach out and again yes a huge shout out for her to come who came and presented to us as well um, and all of the help that she has given us so as you heard in our PowerPoint presentation, Mary Beth Tinker is a free um, speech activist known for her role in the 1969 Tinker versus um, Des Moines Independent School District Supreme Court case, which ruled that Warren Harding Junior High School could not punish her for wearing a black armband in school in support of a truth and the Vietnam War. We are so happy and thankful to have you here with us, sharing your truth with the young people on call today. I think it's phenomenal that at age 13, you're able to take a whole entire case to Supreme Court. I think it's remarkable. And I think that young people all across the country who are interested in advocacy really do look up to you. So it's my absolute honor to introduce Mary Beth Tinker. How are you doing today? Thank you, Weston. It's my absolute honor to be with you. And, and thank you all for inviting me for that wonderful review about the First Amendment and kids speaking up in schools. And it is a good way of life. And thank you, Weston, for using your First Amendment rights in your wonderful storytelling segment that you did. And I recommend that to everyone when you tell about the, your experience growing up and being in foster care. And it's so powerful. So thank you for using your rights because that changes people and it changes our society for the better and we certainly need change in our society right now we're not going to accept the way things are and that's the power of young people is that you don't accept the way things are you want to make things better so thank you yes absolutely thank you so so much so would you be willing to um, take a little bit of time to share your story and how you made it to the supreme court at 13 and just share with everyone about all of that of course, I'll just make it brief and then we can open it up and, and um, we can take some more questions and comments because I want to hear how other people, how some of you all are using your First Amendment rights today to make a difference. And I know so many of you are. When I was growing up, it was uh, mighty times like now. And really, I think we were inspired, at least I certainly was. And I know some of the, this wasn't, Mary Beth Tinker taking a stand. There was a whole group of people and it was in Des Moines, Iowa. And I had been inspired by the black kids of the civil rights movement. Kids like those in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963, when I was 10 years old, these 2000 kids of the age like eight, nine, 10, 15, they marched in Birmingham against racism against the Ku Klux Klan and the violence and the reign of terror that the white supremacists were, were had unleashed and had for years and years and years and years. And so these kids are so brave and that's one of the great powers of young people is courage. And so they marched and sang and, and I, was, I saw them on the news. It's really a story of, of the free press also, which is one of the other First Amendment rights, the freedom of the press. And so these kids, you know, we saw them, well, to punish them, the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK, bombed the kids' headquarters. It was the 16th Street Baptist Church there in Birmingham. On a Sunday morning, 
September 15, 1963. I had just turned 11 years old when I saw and heard what the KKK had done to these brave kids. And a man named James Baldwin, the writer James Baldwin, and and other, they decided that what we should do all over the country was to wear black armbands like this, to mourn for the little girls, the four girls who were killed when the KKK bombed the church. Cynthia, Addie Mae, Carol, and Denise, they were age 11 to 14 years old then. And so, they decided that we should all wear black armbands and have memorial services all over the country. And that was my first experience with wearing a black armband because it's a symbol of mourning for being sad. And I found out, I started to learn that using your rights and your First Amendment rights can be a powerful way to deal with grief and frustration and your sadness about the way society is, the injustice of society. And so we wore black armbands that year, but it wasn't in school. And so then things continued and people kept standing up against racism like now. In 1964, there was Freedom Summer, where three young people were again murdered by the white supremacists. And their names were James Cheney, Mickey Schwarner and Andrew Goodman. And there's a movie about that called Mississippi Burning. But these three young people, there were a group of college students that were called to Mississippi by a man named Robert Moses and Ella Baker and others from the Civil Rights Movement, from a group named SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, one of the most important groups in the United States. And John Lewis, who just died, he was a he was the head of it for a while too, John Lewis. So anyway, that year, 1964, these three kids, young people from SNCC were murdered again by the KKK in Mississippi. Why? Because they had helped African Americans register to vote there. And when those kids were murdered, those young people were murdered, some high school kids, in Mississippi wore buttons to school to protest. And this is turned out to be the basis of a lot of those rights in school that you just talked about in the review of school rights. Because the kids in Mississippi wore buttons to school and they were suspended. They were black students and their buttons said one man, one vote. And they were suspended from school for wearing those buttons, but they started a court case and they challenged that. And the case was called Burnside. And that was in 1964, before we wore black armaments to school. But all of this was inspiring to us. We didn't know a lot about the Burnside case until later, but eventually they would win their case at the appeals court. Why? Because the court said they had not substantially disrupted school. And that's where that standard comes from that is still followed today, that you still talked about in the first part of the, of the workshop, that you cannot substantially disrupt school. So that was called Burnside. So all of this was building up and going on. And so by 1965 then, Oh, I forgot to say, the same day that Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, the same day their bodies were found in Mississippi, August 4th, 1964, off the coast of Vietnam, a U.S. Navy ship claimed it was attacked, USS Maddox, and it turns out it was not attacked. But it didn't stop the U.S. Congress from voting almost unanimously then that year to escalate the Vietnam War with the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. And so by 1965, Christmas time, I had just turned 13 years old that Christmas, and now we were seeing war, war, war on the news all the time, the horrific images of the bombings and 
the children running from their burning huts. And we felt that we should do something about it, us kids, but we didn't know what to do. And so uh, we heard about an idea. Some high school kids had to wear black armbands again, but this time wear them to school. So I decided to join them. And when the principals heard about it, they made a rule against black armbands. And when I, that came out in the newspaper and then I didn't know what to do. It was kind of a dilemma because I didn't want to get in trouble and I was scared. But I kept thinking of those other brave kids, like the kids in Birmingham. And they even risked their lives. And they lost their lives. And I thought, well, at least they, I probably won't get killed for doing this. And I should take a stand for peace because that's how I had been raised. My father was a minister. And by this time we were Quakers and that was all about peace. And so I wanted to speak up about how sad I was about the war. And that's how I ended up wearing a black armband. And five kids were suspended for wearing black armbands to school. And I, I was so scared and nervous when I, when I did that. And when I got to the principal's office, and Mr. Willitson, the vice principal, and he said, now, Mary Beth, take off that arm in. It's against the rules. And so in a great stand of courage, I looked around the office and I said, OK, Mr. Willitson. And I took off the armband. But I learned a very important lesson. You don't have to be the most courageous person in the world. You can be you. You can be scared. You probably will be scared and nervous. But you can still do something and you can still take a stand. And so that's what happened. And if it wasn't for the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, and I'm so glad that they, they did that great tutorial. And if anyone ever wants to know more about your rights, go to the ACLU and you can find other Know Your Rights, um, you can find your questions answered there. But the ACLU heard about it. And the ACLU has been around for over 100 years. And, and they believe in, it's all about the Bill of Rights, especially the First Amendment. And the ACLU is very active right now. They're challenging what's going on in Portland, Oregon, and how the protesters are being attacked. And they challenge the stop and frisk. They stand up for racial justice and equality for women and, and trans and gay people. The ACLU didn't think it was fair because they also stand up for kids' rights. This is a human rights issue, the rights of young people, the rights of kids, and it's an international issue. All over the world, young people have been discriminated against and disrespected. It's very, very important that young people are heard because you have such wonderful creative ideas and you have a sense of fairness. And when you are not allowed to express yourselves, not only are you cheated, but the whole world, the whole society is cheated of your input. Because there is a right to hear ideas also. Yes, you have a right to express yourself, but we want, others have a right to hear ideas also. And when your ideas are suppressed, the rest of, the society doesn't get to hear you. So the ACLU came and they offered to take our case to court and we lost at the district court. And then we lost at the appeals court. Right around the time that we lost at the appeals court over in Mississippi, the Burnside kids who were protesting the Ku Klux Klan, they won. And so now you have two appeals courts in different parts of the country saying different things. And so it was appealed to the Supreme Court. And we were really happy they took the case. They don't take very many cases per year. They take about 75 cases a year out of around 10,000. There's a very important case having to do with foster kids and whether gay parents should be allowed to have foster kids or whether some religious groups like Catholic Charities is challenging and, and saying that they have a right to block gay parents from foster kids. And so there are so many important cases. That case is called Fulton v. Philadelphia. There are so many cases that 
are important at the Supreme Court. There was a huge one recently where LGBTQ people, including me, won the protection of the Civil Rights Act, which was in 1964, right around the time that, right after Cheney, Goodman, and, and Schwerner were killed. That is when Lyndon Johnson passed the Civil Rights Act. And it took young people speaking up and standing up and taking some risks. Another thing that young people are so good at, taking risks, having courage. And so 1964 was the Civil Rights Act, but the recent case at the Supreme Court ruled that LGBTQ people are protected by the Civil Rights Act. So it's a major victory. So these are some of the legal ways that we can stand up for LGBTQ and stand up against racism and, all, and, and injustice and take a stand and be involved. And that's what young people have always done through history and so many young people are again today. So now, what else would you all like to, um, do you wanna talk about some things you're doing or do you have other questions or comments? I just really want to say, Mary Beth, I think um, I can say for all of us that we really look up to you and we thank you for everything you've done. And, you know, in a way, it sounds like you have really paved the way for free speech and understanding that you have a right to stand up for what you believe in, and that's your right, and to kind of hone in on what is important to you, you know, kind of just make that change and invoke that change and use your voice to, you know, be heard and to be and, you know, to be validated and to feel, you know, represented, you know. Um, so it looks like we did have a question um, that came in advance. And the question was, did you know when you started um, that your protest would affect so many um, kids beyond your school district and so many years later? No, I had, I had no idea. And that's how it usually is. History is usually made by the small actions of ordinary people. And I don't know about all of you, but I am so ordinary. And I was a very ordinary kid growing up in Iowa. And I had no idea that this was going to turn out to be so important. One of my first clues about it was when I was in nursing school then, after I graduated high school and we won the case and I went on slowly, I did different jobs. And then I eventually decided to go to nursing school. And our case, Tinker versus Des Moines, was in my nursing school book. And I was so surprised, but it started to slowly occur to me that this case was very important because it had to do with children's rights and teenagers' rights. And young people in our society do not get a good deal. Who is most likely to live in poverty? What age group? Children and teenagers. That kind of says it all. Who endures the trauma of evictions and parents not having work and all of the stresses and traumas, changing schools, schools closing? So many injustices are borne by kids. It's a burden that so many young people are bearing. And so that's why it's powerful when you yourself speak up and stand up for yourself. Sure, adults can speak up for you, but it's not nearly as powerful as when you speak up for yourselves. Yes, thank you so, so much. I think that it, I think it would be such an eye opener to kind of see your name in a textbook and understand that what you've done was much, you, can, you were able to contribute to something that was much larger than yourself. You know, I think that's something that, you know, all of us as, as you know, activism, you know, as advocates really just want to contribute to something that, you know, more than who we are, you know, more than what we're doing and, you know, to really help and benefit other people. So I really, I think that's amazing. That's so true, Weston. That's a good way to put it because it's a way of getting beyond yourself. And it feels so good. Like as I travel around the country speaking to young people, I always ask, like, let's say they go to the school board to protest some you know, dress code violate or some racism, or they start an anti-racism club in their school or LGBTQ club. And I ask the students, how did that feel when you did that? And they always say, I felt great. 
So I've decided um, as a nurse too, through the years I've worked with kids and I've decided that it's really good for your health mm -hmm. to use your rights and to know your rights. And that's why I'm so glad you're having this workshop. It's good for your physical health. It's good for your mental health, your social and psychological health. It's, it's just good for you to know your rights and then use them because your rights are like your muscles. And if you don't use them, you can lose them. So use your rights. And it's a good feeling when you do. Yes, absolutely. It's really, honestly, I think, you know, it's very liberating and rewarding to be able to know your rights and to use your rights. Um, there was an advanced question that came into that said, will this activism work help me in the future for a job opportunity, like being a social worker or a lawyer? Absolutely. Activism helps you in every aspect of your life, because first of all, you're going to feel more grounded, like you have, you know, something meaningful in your life. It's important. And then if you're going to be a social worker, that's all about advocating for, for the rights of people because there's a million nurses, social workers, teachers, psychologists who are picking up the pieces of our unjust, unfair, cruel policies in this country. And that's basically the, the job we've been assigned. So while we're doing that, sure, I'm, I was a trauma nurse with teenagers. I took care of kids that get shot and, you know, get in car crashes and everything else. But while I'm patching up this kid who has a hole in his chest, I also want to go to the local council and try to advocate for a law that will have better housing, fair housing where kids will have, you know, after school programs, where young people will be able to be on the city council or, or vote themselves. And, and so look at it from more deep level, a policy level of how to change these, these things also, besides just patching up things. So yes, whatever career or whatever job you want to go into, I found that activism is a big help. It's a good way of life. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. I think that when you're kind of navigating through a career path you want to use, and I think while you're in foreign activism and understanding like your interests and your passions, and that kind of ties into your career too, and you kind of use, you know, all those things that you believe in and all those things that you advocate for to kind of tie into how you want to make that change for your own career. Um, so it looks like we have another question. Um, so how does your activism play in your, into your career? How does my activism? Well, I talked about being a nurse and then I was just, eventually I just got tired of taking care of kids who are paying the price for policies that they had no say in whatsoever. Like I remember this kid who had been shot and he rolled through the doors of my trauma unit and he had a big tattoo of a dollar sign on his neck. And I thought to myself, gee, isn't that ironic? Justin, or what his name was, he has a tattoo of dollar sign, but he has absolutely no say about the budget and whether his school would have the budget to have those things that he needs and whether his parents would be making enough money at their job or whether they'd be getting a minimum wage and whether they would have the money for a good housing or apartment. And I, I got tired of, of just taking care of kids who had no say. And so I decided I really need to encourage you young people to speak up for yourselves and change this. Um, so a lot of my activism has had to do with the rights of kids and speaking up for the rights of kids in various issues, whether it has to do with anti-racism, like right now more and more especially, and um, but always really through the years, and having to do with the rights of women. And I was gay, I became gay when I was in high school. And, um, you know, back then it was, it was hard because the feeling was that you must, there must be something wrong with you if you're gay. Like you must be mentally ill or something like that. 
And so I took that to heart and I felt bad in some ways. And then slowly I started just learning more and, and thinking about it differently and meeting people that really helped and inspired me. And so it was a journey. But um, so I started advocating for gay rights also. And really, it has to do a lot with policies. And so I try to work on changing policies. Like, right, I live in Washington, D.C., where we have some of the worst inequality in the world. Um, black families have something like 80 times less wealth than white families here. And so about a week ago, there was a vote in the DC Council to raise taxes on the very wealthy just a little bit. And so a lot of us were advocating for that. And so we, we're working on policies that would change these things. And also things like the police in the schools. I believe that police should not be in the schools. I was at a high school here in DC where I saw a police handcuff a black student with dreads and he threatened to break the kid's neck. I asked the policeman, why are you handcuffing that kid? And he said, well, so I don't have to break his neck. And I'm a nurse. I take care of kids with, with broken bones and necks. And I said, are you saying you would break his neck? He said, yeah, yeah, because if he does anything, I have to break his neck. So therefore, the ACE, I was with the ACLU and, and we had I was part of it and I, I said, we should start a training program for the police. This was about 10 years ago, which we did. We had a training program and a lot of the officers got involved and my part was to teach them about adolescent development. Well, the whole program fizzled out. The, the police weren't really all that interested, especially at the higher levels. So now I've come to believe that training isn't going to work. It's not enough. We need to redirect the money from the police into other services for kids and that you young people yourselves should be the ones to decide what the most useful uh you know expenses would be to spend that money on which is why i believe now also that 16 year olds should vote and we had a big campaign here last year and it lost in the dc council by one vote but there are other cities, other places that are working on that as well. And I do believe that teenagers should be able to vote. But we have a big election coming up in November and you don't have to vote to be involved in it. You can get out and campaign. I was campaigning with some ninth graders about a year ago for a different election. And we were going out canvassing and they were talking to voters about why they supported this certain candidate. Why? Because they, this candidate was all for kids for the schools and for putting more money into kids issues and i think you should look at and expect your candidates to have a kids platform what is their platform for young people what is their platform when it has to do with lgbtq and other issues i think that's i i think that one of the things that really stuck out to me i was like when you said you're advocating for yourself i know it's my own story and my own navigation through the foster care system, I, at times I had to definitely advocate for myself as well. You know, I think that being able to not only advocate for other people, but know to advocate for yourself too. And I think mm -hmm. that's so important. Um, and I do want to say that we are um, getting ready to wrap up. And I want to thank you so, so much for taking your time to be here with us today and, you know, sharing your story and being open to answering questions. And I, re I really had a great time talking with you. Thank you too. It was such a, a great uh, time to be with all of you and speaking about this issue, which is so important for all of us today, especially. And thank you to Family Equality and to all of the great work that, that all of you are doing. Take care. And also, if anyone ever wants to write to me, write to me at marybethtinker at gmail and I'll write you back and tell me some of the things that you are doing to use your First Amendment rights and to change our society for the better. Thanks, everybody.